1968, when I went to the NIH, there was no receptor biology. And in fact, there was no consensus that these receptor molecules even existed. Uh, but my two mentors there uh, thought they might, and I was given the project of trying to develop techniques to study a particular kind of receptor for a hormone. Uh, and I didn't realize just how challenging, since I had no perspective, uh, I didn't realize just how challenging and daunting that assignment was. Nobody had ever done anything like that. Uh, and as I said, for 18 months, I flailed and failed. Uh, but I did eventually meet with a modicum of success and started to like it and saw the, the value in studying receptors. I mean, I, I could see a vision of where that might go, although in retrospect, I had no idea just how far it could go. Uh, so when I set up my own laboratory uh, at Duke, I decided to study receptors. Uh, but since I was now a cardiovascular physician, uh, I chose very deliberately to study something called adrenergic receptors, which means receptors for adrenaline. Uh, these are the targets of beta blockers, which are commonly used drugs. Uh, in retrospect, that turned out to be a, a very felicitous choice, uh, of course, I had no way of knowing that then. Uh, so that's how I got interested in it in the first place, and then I just kind of ran with it. I often tell people that if I knew then what I know now, there's no way I would have done this uh, because it was so difficult as it turned out. And I can say this in all honesty, it never crossed my mind that I would fail. And I don't know why that is. It almost seems like delusional uh, because there was no proof that these things even existed. And yet it was raw intuition. It just seemed to me, of course they exist. I mean, how else could it all work? And, you know, I, was no, I didn't have a PhD. I, I was not a biochemist. I wasn't anything. Uh, I was a physician. Uh, so I was kind of self-taught over the next few years. And, you know, I gathered students and postdocs together. And uh, off, we, off we rode into the, into the night uh, to try to figure it all out. And, uh, you know... I talk about sometimes the chutzpah of youth. It was totally chutzpah dick, as we say in Yiddish. It was just filled with chutzpah, uh, brazen gall that you would think you could do that. Uh, but you know, in the end, it worked. And uh, exactly why, I can't say. Uh, I guess it was uh, meant to be. It's not only that I was not filled with self-doubt. I didn't have any self-doubt. And it was not that I was an arrogant person. It was just like, even with all the failure that I had had and with all the failure that would come my way over the next 15, 20 years, I mean, it just seemed to me it was always a question of when, not if, things would work. You have to have a huge tolerance for uh, frustration and failure, which I do not innately have. That is not, just ask my wife sometime. Uh, I mean, I have no uh, patience with failure. So how I survived it all, I don't really know. Uh, receptors are molecules we now know on cells with which hormones and drugs interact to begin their biological actions. To give you a specific example, consider adrenaline, also known as epinephrine. Uh, let's say we have a patient with asthma and their airways are constricted, they can't breathe. We give them adrenaline, and the airways relax because the smooth muscle in their uh, airways relaxes when the adrenaline works on it. How does the adrenaline know to work on that and to stimulate the heart rather than to work on your nose or your retina or something like that? Well, the answer is, and what seemed obvious to me, is there must be molecules on the cells that the adrenaline would bind to much like a key interacts with a lock, where the key would be the adrenaline, but it could be any hormone, by extension. And this mystical receptor I was looking for would be like a lock on the cell, and it would fit in, and the adrenaline would then do something to that lock, open it, and things would happen in the cell. That was the idea. Uh, so how to prove this? Well, the first, there was no way to even study it. 
So the first thing we had to do was find some way to study these things. So I used, again, just a relatively simple idea. The idea is simple. In practice, it's very difficult, which was to take molecules that I had reason to believe could interact with this receptor, like beta blockers, which had just been developed, and radioactively label them and use that radioactivity as a way of following the binding, the sticking interaction of that molecule to the receptor. And then with this radioactive probe stuck to it, now I could try to isolate it following the radioactivity as a marker. And over a period of years, we got that to work for several receptors. And then we dissolved the cell membranes, plucked the receptors out, the receptors are very rare. So for example, for every two or 300,000 protein molecules in the cell membrane, one of them would be this receptor. And so the next job was to isolate this receptor, to get rid of the 199,999 that aren't the receptor and just get receptor, okay? Yeah, exactly. Extraordinarily difficult work. But we succeeded in doing that and showed that this one isolated molecule could do the two things that a receptor would do. First, it could bind or interact with drugs that were known to interact with that receptor, and in a way that would be predicted by the physiology. That is, if I had three things that could work on that receptor, and we knew from physiological experiments that say drug one was better than drug two was better than drug three, then my protein should bind drug one better than two, better than three. Only there weren't just three, there were dozens. So we could test that very rigorously. So that was the first criterion. The second criterion is that binding of a drug like adrenaline to this receptor, that that receptor could now do something, stimulate the cell to do stuff. Now that was even tougher. So we came up with methods where we found cells that didn't have adrenaline receptors. How did we know they didn't have? Well, because they couldn't bind these radioactive probes. But they did have the response machinery, okay, because they had receptors for other things. And then we took these receptors, and by techniques that we worked out, we were able to plug them back into the outside of these cells. And now the cells responded to adrenaline. So now I knew that this pure receptor molecule that I had could do both things that you'd expect a receptor to do, interact with something like adrenaline and do something to the cell. We went on from there, and the next series of discoveries after we had purified this receptor was to do what's called cloning the gene, okay? Uh, that allows us, because of the work on DNA, which we've been hearing a bit about at this meeting, and of course, by the 80s, this was the era of, recomb era of recombinant DNA was picking up steam, all based on Jim Watson and Crick's original discovery from, uh, I guess, the 60s uh, about DNA. So we were able to ultimately clone the gene for this one particular receptor and thereby deduce its complete amino acid sequence. And when we did that, we made a remarkable discovery. And the discovery was it looked just like another molecule. And that molecule is called rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is the molecule in the eye that allows you to see. And when we saw that, this was in 1986, I realized immediately that, you know, I'll bet there's a huge family of receptors that all look like this. In a sense, rhodopsin is a light receptor. And it looked just like what's called the beta adrenergic receptor, which is one of these adrenaline receptors that I was studying. And I said, if these two so disparate in their function look alike. What about receptors for histamine, serotonin, dopamine, you name it? I bet they all look alike. So using the techniques that we had developed very quickly over the next few years, we were able to get the genes for about 10 or 12 of these different receptors. And they all looked the same. I mean, they have distinct sequences, very close though. I mean, you know, you might have 60, 70% of all the amino acids would be the same, but enough were different that they did different things. Meanwhile, all these technologies uh, were being adapted by the drug companies. And so the pace of drug discovery increased dramatically because they went from testing drugs in animals to being able to use the isolated genes that we had and that they could now find. 
And then it turned out that there were about a thousand different members of this family, not just rhodopsin and the beta receptor and the others I mentioned, but the smell receptors. Turned out the way we smell is by substances binding to receptors in our nose that look just like these. And then it turned out the way we taste, bitter and sweet, uh, looks like that. So now you had three of the five senses working that way. Well, it turns out this family of receptors regulate virtually all processes in animals. And today, about half of all the drugs used clinically around the world target one or another of these receptors. I mean, things like beta blockers or antihistamines or opiates or you name it. Uh, so the work in the end had an impact far beyond what I could have imagined in 1970, say, when I was just beginning to do this. Probably the single biggest was, aha, it looks like rhodopsin. How crazy is that? I mean, no, none of us expected that. None of us expected that. So that was a true eureka, unpredicted. Nobody knew it was coming. There are these data banks of sequences, and the sequence of rhodopsin uh, had been determined a couple of years before. Uh, and so once we had our sequence of the beta adrenergic receptor, we just compared it uh, with that. And uh, I remember calling a collaborator. We were so excited. I mean, we realized this one evening. Uh, and uh, I remember calling a collaborator in New Jersey, and we couldn't find them, and it was crazy. Uh, we finally got hold of them. But we knew immediately, as soon as we saw that, we, we understood the significance of it. And the fact that this that there would be much work to do to prove it, but immediately it suggested the hypothesis that there might be a huge family of these receptors, and that by getting the first one, we'd be able to get others because they looked a lot, very similar. Uh, now, did I realize in that moment how broad the implications would be for medicine? No, I mean that would take a number of years. I think that came more gradually over a period of the next five or six years. I, I would say within about five years, it was clear to me that, wow. And because I could see the drug companies, uh, they, they had been adapting our technologies right from the earliest days. So to really innovate a, a scientific field, you almost have to develop new technology. And that's what we were doing. In the, there were no ways to study receptors. So at every step of the way through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we were inventing technology to do that and sharing it completely. In fact, I didn't even patent anything. Uh, somebody was asking me today over lunch, did you patent this stuff? Yeah, it was Ted Olson. He said, did you patent any of that? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, it never occurred to me. Uh, very different today. Today, we patent our discoveries. But back then, you know, it, things weren't so entrepreneurial. They weren't so commercial. And there were these two uh, uh, tech uh, networking gurus that were talking just now. And apparently they collaborated a bunch and done a lot of things together. And, uh, but they have totally different personalities, and they were stressing that. And I would stress the same thing, that there's no one right way to do it. But I tend to be very extroverted and enthusiastic. I am kind of a Pied Piper. I would sort of bring my students and fellows along, you know, dream these grand dreams and schemes and this and that, and somehow get them working together with me. Because uh, many of the techniques we invented relied on the brilliance and expertise of my students and fellows, expertise that I did not have. I had a vision, uh, and I had some expertise, uh, but there was a lot of expertise I needed that I didn't have. But students and fellows were excited enough by what I was doing that they wanted to join the effort. And so over the years, uh, we did that. And in fact, one of the fellows who worked with me in the 1980s, Brian Kobilka, who's a professor at Stanford now, would ultimately share the Nobel Prize for me. Not for the work he did with me, although that was part of it, I think, but for work he did independently here at Stanford. And his personality and mine could not be more different. And we have very different, we have very different styles. Uh, so that's another thing. You have to do it your way. Uh, and uh, General Petraeus was just now talking about leadership and leadership styles, etc.
but yeah, my leadership style is very much about being a Pied Piper. Uh, I think any leader has to be able to bring along uh, colleagues and you know the people who work for them, because uh, if they don't buy in, you got nothing. You have to put a team together. I think the days of you know the uh, the, the isolated scientist, you know, working in his or her laboratory all by themselves, that, that just isn't the way it works anymore. Uh, but it's interesting. I'm a very social person, and I often say that if if I if you put me on a desert island. Uh, with all the financial support and equipment and everything that I needed uh, to do science, uh, I would wither and die uh, because I need the stimulation of working with my students and fellows. And in a very real sense, I've always kind of almost viewed that as my central activity, is mentoring the students. And the science, I mean, this is a bit of an overstatement, the science is almost a, a byproduct. It's like, you know, if you're chopping wood, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to get through the tree, but you have all the sawdust that gets generated. And to me, a lot of the papers that we write is almost the sawdust. I mean, mainly what I'm trying to do is shape these young people and sort of show them how I do this, this kind of thing. I just need that human contact. Uh, it's interesting, you know, they're introverts and extroverts. I mean, introverts are drained by social interaction. They got to go take take a little time by themselves just to regenerate their battery. I'm the opposite. My batteries get charged by interacting with my students and fellows. Uh, so that is a big, a big part of what I do. They had a big uh, 60th birthday party for me. That would have been 11 years ago at Duke. And about half of my trainees returned from around the world. I've trained almost 250 people in my lab. Uh, at the time, it was about 200. And uh, about a hundred of them came back, and we had this. They had this all kinds of activities, and they had this big scientific festschrift for me. And they they gave talks, and they all told vignettes. And one of them told that story, where he basically said that you know one of the things that kept him going when he was in my lab was no matter how dark things got, I would always convince him that his was the most important project in the lab, and he had to keep going because this was it. And he said it was only after he had left the lab and he was at something with one of the other guys in the lab, and this was years later, and he was telling him that story. And this other fellow said, well, he always told me mine was the most important project. And then they talked to several others. Turned out apparently I'd given everybody the same message. Uh, but, you know, uh, I believed it. Uh, they were all the most important projects. It's one of the most difficult things that there is. And uh, once one is established and has his own laboratory, it's much easier for you as the lab chief because there's so many things going on in the lab. Something's working all the time. Most isn't, but at least there's the one thing you can hang your head on. But for that student, uh, that's all they got. And I use humor a lot. Uh, humor is very important to me. Now, there are basically two kinds of people, funny people and not funny people, okay? And most people think I'm pretty funny. Uh, I don't tell jokes, but I, I have an offbeat perspective on things. And so I try to use humor a lot. Uh, so often, you know, for example, somebody's experiments aren't working, a graduate student, and they'll tell me that they will talk about it, and I'll look at them, and I'll say something along the lines of, now look, I know it doesn't look good right now, but here's what we're going to do. I want you to put your best people on this, your whole team. And they'll say, but I don't have a team. I'm just a graduate student. But then they'll laugh. They'll realize how totally absurd that is. Uh, and I play all kinds of games with them. Uh, and, yeah, I use humor a lot. Uh, that, that, that helps the suffering. I mean, for example, the other something I've been doing the last few years that I got into totally spontaneously, we, we were collaborating with a pharmaceutical company, and the culture in pharma is totally different than the culture in academia in many ways. So we were having the first of several teleconferences with this company, and uh, we get on the phone, and I have them on speaker, and they have me on speaker. I've got four or five of my students and postdocs with me who are going to be involved in the project. And the guy at the other end of the phone who's like, who knows, the executive vice president for God knows what, 
says, well, before we get started, I'd like to introduce my team. I have, uh, you know, Dr. So-and-so, who's head of synthetic chemistry, Dr. So-and-so, uh, who's head of uh, medicinal chemistry, and so-and-so is head of pharmacology and whatever. And I said, well, well, let me introduce my team. And just off the top of my head, I point to my first guy over here who's a graduate student. I said, I'd like to introduce Dr. So-and-so, who's head of uh, computational biology in my group. Now, the only thing that was true is that this guy is doing a project that has something to do with computational biology. And then I introduced the next guy who's a postdoc who just started, who did have a PhD in chemistry anyway. And I said, the head of my synthetic chemistry division is so-and-so. Uh, and of course, the people in the lab are trying to stifle their laughter. I mean, well, these guys are none the wiser, okay? Uh, and so we had a lot of fun with that. Two weeks later, we were starting another collaboration with another company. I had some of the same people in my office. We went through the same drill, only I changed the titles. The guy who was head of computational biology last week was now head of pharmacology. And, you know, you sort of have fun with it. Uh, so th I think the humor helps a lot. Plus, very important, even when I myself am really frustrated and down, I never let them see it uh, because... I feel it's my job to sort of, you know, keep things upbeat, et cetera. Uh, but it is very, very difficult because, yeah, failure is our constant companion. And I often repeat to them something that, uh, not my mentor, but a senior scientist at the NIH said to me once. We were having lunch together. I was despondent, despondent, because nothing had worked. I had been there a year. And this guy said to me, look, he says, do you know the difference, Bob, between an average scientist and a world-class scientist? I said, no. He says, here's what it is. He said, for the average scientist, maybe 1% of their experiments work. But for the world-class guy, the world beater, it could be as high as 1.5% or 2%. And then, <laughs> that really stuck with me because it's really true. It's that little difference. But still, 98% doesn't work even if you're winning the Nobel Prize. My mother, uh, she had very high expectations of me. I have very high expectations of me, and I have very high expectations of anybody who works for me. But, and this is a big but, I don't have the same expectations of everyone, okay? So when somebody comes to work with me, I don't really know what I'm getting as a student. Of, how can I? It's like, you know, can you really know somebody when you marry them, what they'll be like 10 years later? You don't know until you live with somebody, but that's, you can't live with them to hire them, right? They come for an interview, right? You spend a few hours, you have some letters of recommendation, and you make your sh decision. Then you got them, and you don't really know. But I get to know them very, very well, and that happens very quickly. Now, once I understand what I got, then I begin to form expectations. I mean, you know, you can't take somebody, uh, I'm much like a coach in that regard. So, you know, basketball is big at Duke University. We got Coach K, uh, you know, fabulous basketball team. So in a certain sense, part of my work is as a coach. So let's say, I don't know if you know anything about basketball. Let's say I got a guy who's 5'3", who's really quick. I don't make him a center, okay? Let's say I got a guy who's 7'1", got a great hook shot, can dunk, but very slow afoot. I don't make him a shooting guard, okay? So you got to work with what you got. And, you know, some people are brilliant. Some are less gifted. Uh, some people are beautiful experimentalists, but they're not very good at synthesizing things. Some people are the opposite. So you got to learn to put people in positions where they can succeed by playing to their strengths. Uh, so I have different levels of expectations. And if I realize in the fullness of time that I have somebody who maybe isn't all that gifted, well, I can't have the same expectations. It's not fair to them, and it'll frustrate the hell out of me. So it's very important that I learn to really understand each of my trainees. For the most part, uh, prizes like the Nobel Prize are in my mind, what's the word? symbolic, uh, and you give it to an individual, but it's really a team effort. Uh, I mean, I, probably uh, the extreme case was probably the physics prize last year for the Higgs boson, where they gave it to three guys. 
but as I understand it, there were, the, the discovery that proved this thing existed involved two teams, each with 3,000 physicists. Uh, so that's sort of, to me, the limit case. But you can't give it to 3,000 people. Uh, so yes, I, I mentioned 50 people, and I probably should have mentioned another 50. But I was trying to distribute the credit as widely as I could. And I, I had a very touching experience that relates to just that thing. So remarkably, uh, many of my alumni came to the Nobel. Uh, they came on their own nickel. They had to pay for themselves to get there. These are people who, you know, were alumni of the lab from around the world. They could not come to the ceremony or the banquet because you only get 14 tickets. And I have a big family and, you know, I have hundreds of, of alumni. But they came just to be there and be part of it. Uh, and, uh, of course, I shared the prize with one of them. Uh, so we had a big uh, reception uh, Brian and I, for about 70 or 80 who were there, amazingly, most of whom, of course, were from my lab. Uh, they flew to Stockholm just to be there. They came to the lecture. The Nobel lectures are open to the public. And then they watched the ceremonies from various sports bars and, and the hotel and various people's rooms, etc. Well, at, at the uh, ceremony, uh, or at the lecture, rather, was one of my fellows from the 80s, who had actually been a collaborator in the lab with Brian Kobilka, had done very important work. And he's gone on to a nice career in academia, not a stellar one. He's had a difficult personal journey in that his wife uh, died of breast cancer along the way, and he was left to raise their two daughters alone. Uh, I had not seen him for probably 15 years before the Nobel, uh, but he was there with his two daughters, now I think 18 and 16 or 20 and 18, one of whom wants to be a scientist. And he took me, and I didn't even know they were in the audience till afterwards. And I had called, he was one of the 50 I called out by name and showed one of the things he had done back 30 years ago. And he came over to me afterwards and he said, he says, I just want to thank you for that. He says, if you knew what it meant to my daughters to hear my name mentioned, and, yeah. So they, they understood what their father had done for the very first time. Yeah, that meant a lot to me. The last slide that I showed in my Nobel lecture, which you can see online, was a slide from my 60th birthday party where there were about 100 of my former trainees there. And the photographer took a picture of us. I'm standing in the middle. And then just spur of the moment, he says, let's do something different, he says. He didn't even suggest anything. All of a sudden, they lifted me up and body surfed me to the back. And I have that picture, okay? A hundred of my trainees, and I'm held up in the air like this, okay? And to me, it's symbolic because, yeah, they held me aloft. And so the le I showed that for the last slide of my Nobel lecture, which is published. And then in the back row, I pulled out a face, which you can see in the picture, and pulled it to the side. And I said, and now I said, I want to point out one of these individuals. I pulled this, you know, and the slide comes out. I said, I said, this is Brian Kobilka. He's your next speaker. And I sat down. Uh, and that's how I introduced him, because he lectured right after me. <laughs> Everybody loves to hear about the call, and it is everything they say. It's an amazing, life changing experience. So the first question is did I expect it? Okay, that's what everybody wants to know. And the answer is yes and no. Okay. Why might it be yes? Well, for 20 years, people have been telling me, you're going to get the prize. Why haven't you gotten the prize already? Are you ever going to get the prize? I mean, they, they just, you know, it was a, a constant drumbeat. In fact, I have an honor that, uh, or a distinction, I should say, that I suspect there are a lot of Nobel laureates here, but I'll bet none of them, I don't think, have this one. In 2003, almost a full decade before I won the Nobel Prize, in the Durham Morning Herald, and I have a slide of this, which I show in kind of a funny talk I give sometimes called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to Stockholm. In 2003, in mid-October, after Nobel Week had passed, and once again, I had not won the Nobel Prize, uh, 
My picture appears on the front page of the Durham Herald, which is the local paper in Durham, North Carolina. The headline is, Stockholm calling, not this year. And then the sub thing is, Robert J. Lefkowitz is Duke's best hope for the Nobel Prize. And then a lengthy article uh, with my picture on the front page uh, about how, once again, I have failed to win the Nobel Prize. In this talk, I talk about her and her pestering. And then I show this article. And then, of course, the punchline is, how many people do you know who were on the front page of the paper for not winning the Nobel Prize? Uh, and I don't know anybody. Uh, but <laughs> and then the next slide in this talk uh, is a picture from something called The Independent, I think, which is one of these throwaway newspapers that you get at the Whole Foods market. You know, you pick them up for free. And uh, so the Independent w was in the food markets the next week with a big smiling picture of me. And the headline on the front, it's on the front of the paper is, why is this man smiling? And then it says, he finally won the Nobel Prize. Finally. Not he won the Nobel Prize. He finally won the Nobel Prize. Okay. So that's the yes part, you know, uh, the no part. And there was no, I, I, part of me wasn't surprised that it finally happened. But the yes part is just as dramatic. First of all, I'm a physician scientist. If I was going to win the Nobel Prize, I would have thought it would have been in medicine. It never occurred to me that I might win the Nobel Prize in chemistry. Second of all, their secrecy, which is much vaunted, is the real deal. There were no rumors this year, that year. There was nothing, you know, sometimes you see somebody gives you a clue, oh, I heard their talk and you're on the short. Nothing. Zero. Nada. Now, the Nobel Prizes, as you probably know, are announced in a set order every year. There's Nobel Week. Monday is medicine. Tuesday is physics. Wednesday is chemistry. Thursday is economics. Friday is literature. Monday is peace. Okay. Monday came and went. Medicine. No call. I no longer waited for it. There was a period of time for a number of years, probably in my 50s and 60s, where, you know, I can't say I was waiting for the call, but it wouldn't have surprised me. But I had pretty much abandoned that. I had let go of it. For sure, I wasn't waiting by the phone on Wednesday, okay, which is chemistry day. But Wednesday, the phone rings at 5 a.m. Uh, I sleep with earplugs, so I don't hear the phone. Uh, my wife, fortunately, does not. She picks it up, so she knows before I do. She hears a Swedish voice say, is Professor Lefkowitz there? She gives me an elbow, which she denies, but I'm quite sure she did. <laughs> she gives me the elbow, and she says, there's somebody calling from Stockholm. Uh, so immediately, you know right there. But my mind is racing. What the hell is this? This is Wednesday. Why would they be calling me? And very quickly, this woman says, I, Dr. Lefkowitz, I'd like to put on Dr. So-and-so, the uh, chairman of the Chemistry Nobel Prize Committee from the Royal Swedish Academy. He has some good news for you. Well, so there you know. And the interesting thing was, I think if you were taking an EKG, I have a very slow pulse. Uh, I work out a lot, plus I take beta blockers, interestingly enough. Uh, so my resting pulse is 50. Uh, it did not shoot to 100. Maybe it went to 55. I did not have this amazing you know, surge of, oh, my God. It was more like a, this very quiet feeling of satisfaction. Wow, it finally happened. And the very first question I asked was, am I sharing this with anybody? Because you never know what they're going to do. And when they told me Kobilka, then I teared up. I mean, I was just to know that I would get it with one of my students. I missed a haircut. I was getting a haircut that day, and it, it went by the boards. <laughs> and that was quoted widely. In fact, about three days later, I finally went for that haircut. And I was on my way across campus. And of course, everybody by then knew who I was. Uh, and I ran into a, a colleague who I didn't know well. And he wanted a chat. Uh, and I said, I'm sorry, but I'm late for, I'm going to get a haircut. He says, ah, you're finally getting that haircut. Because <laughs> everybody knew about that haircut. <laughs> oh, golly. I was born in 1943. And so my earliest memories date to, I guess, the late 40s. Uh, one of my earliest is television. Uh, the very first 
television set in my neighborhood appeared in 1948 when I was five, and we would all gather in the uh, in in the apartment. Of course, I lived in a tall apartment building, uh, and we would all gather in a friend's apartment uh, to watch something called the Howdy Doody Show, uh, which became a real classic. Of course, uh, in those days, the uh, there was programming on only three stations, the three major networks, and it was only from about 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. each day. The rest of the time, there was a test pattern on the TV. So the programming would begin at 5 p.m., and so we would gather about 10 of 5 uh, and sit around, six or eight of us uh, little kids, uh, and we'd watch the test pattern. Uh, with the tone in the background until 5 o'clock when the program would start. Uh, those are the kind of memories I have. It was a totally idyllic existence. I mean, it was just fun playing with my friends. Never saw grass uh, at all. It was all pavement. And there was a par- one park, as I recall, with a few blades of grass. Uh, but it was, uh, it was a wonderful, I, I remember it was a very peaceful and, and happy time. Subsequently, a year or two later, uh, they started selling what were basically giant magnifying glasses. So it looked like a, a, a music stand. There was a bass and a pole, and on the top of it was just a big magnifier like this. And you put that in front of your tiny little TV set. So now the thing was a little big. <laughs> my father was an accountant, and my mother was a school teacher. I grew up in a uh, fairly traditional conservative to orthodox Jewish home. Uh, It was a kosher home uh, from which I learned a lot about discipline. Uh, And it was a home that was filled with books. Uh, And uh, I learned to read very early and was somewhat precocious in my reading. Uh, Loved to read. Uh, Would fake illness, particularly a stomach ache, uh, so that I could stay home. Uh, and just read the books uh, rather than go to class when I was in elementary school. And mostly I liked nonfiction. Uh, and I read, I read two types of books, actually. I did read some fiction, but one of the recollections I have, this would have been when I was maybe, maybe 10, 12 at the most, is in the New York Times uh, book section, book review section, which would come out on Sundays. Uh, there would be... Uh, advertisements for book clubs. One was called Literary Guild, and the other was called Book of the Month Club. And there would be coupons that you could clip out to join the book club. And in return for joining the book club, you could pick out either a set of books or several free books, in return for which you agreed to buy some number of titles, usually three or four, in the next year. So I would clip these coupons without my parents' knowledge, uh, send them off, choosing sets of books that I wanted to read, <laughs> which would arrive. Uh, my parents would then ask, what's going on here? I would explain. And then they, of course, since I was a little kid, they were stuck uh, holding the, the bag to buy three or four more books, uh, which, of course, further increased our library, uh, which was great. But I remember at a very young age, I mean, I look back on this now, how ridiculous this was, I bought Winston Churchill's six-volume set, History of the Second World War, read every book, Uh, I was probably 10 or 12 years old. Uh, And then the other one I bought was uh, Sandberg's four-volume biography of Abraham Lincoln, and I read all of those. Uh, So I I, I liked that kind of stuff. The other thing that I was obsessed with was anything to do with medicine, in particular medical fiction. So I had decided by the third grade that I was to be a practicing physician. It was my only goal in terms of uh, professional life. Uh, So I must have been like eight years old when I conceived that goal. And it was based entirely on a single role model, my family physician, Dr. Feibusch, who was a general practice physician in the Bronx who made house calls. And I was totally taken by it. I mean, nothing seemed, I mean, it seemed to me what could be better uh, than to be like Dr. Feibusch. I mean, he was a guy who knew all this stuff that other people didn't know in fancy words. And he could come to the house and take the stethoscope and listen to you and then in an illegible hand write these prescriptions for medicine and then you'd feel better. And I mean, it just, what else could you want to do? 
So I read books which nobody's ever heard of anymore, like some Arrowsmith by Sinclair Lewis, uh, which was about a physician. Uh, there's another one called The Citadel by, I think, A.J. Cronin. Uh, there was another classic. Uh, then one that was a nonfiction title was Microbe Hunters by Paul de Cruyff, which told the story of people like Pasteur and how they tracked down uh, bacteria. And I just loved it. When I won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, uh, I had to write an autobiography, which appears on the Nobel website. And I was trying to come up with some memories in this and that. I was thinking about those books. And so I started going back for the first time and since I was a child to look up something about those books. And I learned the interesting uh, piece of trivia that Paul de Cruyff, who was himself, uh, I forget, a microbiologist or a scientist, and who had written Microbe Hunters, had actually collaborated with uh, the author of Arrowsmith, Sinclair Lewis, who you know was a, a novelist. Uh, I think he he may have even won the Nobel Prize for fiction. Uh, but Paul de Cruyff had actually helped him with some of the medical aspects of his classic Arrowsmith, which you know was about a physician and this and this and that. But yeah, that book was very powerful, uh, Microbe Hunters, uh, for many of my generation. Introduced us to the idea of science. My mother did. Uh, she was never satisfied. Uh, she was an elementary school teacher uh, and very strict. And so, as I recall, she would review my homework. Uh, and if if I had, in those days we wrote with pencils, and I was kind of a sloppy kid, and I made a lot of mistakes, and so I would make erasures all the time. And of course, the more I erased, the more I smudged it, and I, she wouldn't let it through. She said, you got to write the whole thing. And I'd say, Mom, it's, you know, five pages. No, sorry, you got to rewrite the whole thing. If I brought home an A minus, <clears throat> she'd want to know why it wasn't an A. If I brought home an A, why wasn't it an A plus? This never stopped. Uh, so fast forward 40, 50 years. I'm in mid-career, and I'm starting to win a number of prizes, significant prizes for my research. So whenever I would win a prize, I would call my mother up and say, Mom, good news. And she called me Bobby right till the end. She said, what is it, Bobby? And I'd say, well, I won a big prize. What is it? I would tell her. And she'd always say the same thing. It's nice, but it's not the Nobel. That's so, uh, she wasn't happy even then. And when I finally won the Nobel, she was long gone. Although, you know, it was not her goal for me to win the Nobel. Her goal was for me to come to my senses and come back to the practice of clinical medicine. So you see, I started to become a doctor. And I did become a doctor. And I went to medical school. And I did full training. I was board certified in internal medicine and cardiology. The research came later. We can talk about that. But the research came later. And she wasn't so happy about that because she saw practicing medicine as sort of my true destiny, as in fact I had for many years. So the way she seemed to understand things is that somehow along the way, I had been seduced intellectually by some kind of research problem. And the hope was that someday I would figure that out. And with that done, I would come back to my senses and start practicing medicine again. And so whenever I would talk to her about my research, which wasn't that often because she wasn't all that interested in it, she would say, have you figured it out yet, Bobby? The idea being, well, someday I would answer this damn problem and come back and start practicing medicine again but it never happened. I would try to explain to her, you never figure it out, Mom, because every answer raises five new questions. But she never got that. <laughs> Bless her soul. It's funny, I didn't have the sense that they pressured me to go into medicine, you know, my son, the doctor. Uh, I, I didn't get that. That seemed to me to come from me. Uh, where she pressured me was just to perform at the very top level. Fortunately, my dad gave me no pressure at all. He was sort of the opposite. I mean, he was whatever, you know, as long as you're happy. 
I am the eighth Nobel laureate to graduate from the Bronx High School of Science. I don't know if I have it exactly right, but if the Bronx High School of Science was a country, that would place us about 12th on the all-time list of most Nobel prizes by a country. I mean, I may be off on that, but it, it's pretty high. The other seven uh, are, uh, we're all in physics. So I'm the first one in chemistry. And so far, there's been nobody in, to get the prize in medicine. So it's an amazing school. Uh, I, uh, it exists to this day. I was class of 59. I had not been back to the Bronx High School of Science until March of this year, when at their invitation, I paid a visit and spent the whole day. Uh, and it was a marvelous, marvelous day. It was the same building. My class was the first class to graduate from what at the time we called the new building. Uh, and that's where they are to this day. And I had a marvelous day there. I spoke to the students. And of course, uh, you know, to, at a place like Bronx High School of Science, uh, a Nobel laureate is like a rock star, you know. Uh, that's their idea of, you know, the quarterback with the most touchdowns or whatever the <laughs> analogy is. So they, they were really over the moon to see me. And in a very happy uh, turn of circumstances, about half a dozen of my classmates who still live in the city, several of whom I have kept up with, uh, were able to come and spend the day with me as well. It's an amazing school. Uh, there was only one criterion for admission how you did on a, a competitive examination. Nothing else, no letters of recommendation, no teacher's recommendations, no, not what your average was of studies in junior high, just that exam. Uh, and that's become somewhat controversial these days since it doesn't necessarily uh, support the idea of diversity. Uh, but the demographics are totally different. In my day, I'd say 90% of my class were Jewish, uh, immigrant Jewish, descent. Today, uh, almost everybody is of Asian descent. So a totally different demographic. I think a lot of the, uh, of the group that I represented uh, and my classmates did, I think a lot of them have moved out of the city. Those families are no longer in New York City. You have to be in New York City to qualify. Uh, and I think that the uh, Asian American culture is uh, much like the uh, immigrant Jewish European descent culture was uh, back in the 40s and 50s, namely very striving, uh, trying to better themselves, and very much aware of how important education was in that regard. One in particular, Mrs. Gordon, uh, I hated her. Uh, she, I, I took AP English, okay? The AP courses were just starting in the 50s, and uh, you could take a maximum of two. I took chemistry, and AP chemistry, and AP English. Today, the kids come into Duke, they have 10, 12, 15 AP courses. They start taking AP courses in their first year of high school. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. So Mrs. Gordon taught AP English, and uh, she took a disliking to me for some reason early on. And she didn't like the way I wrote. And so she gave me very bad grades uh, on all my essays. And she pounded into me about how to write clear, effective, succinct English. Uh, and I learned those lessons well. But what I remember, and I, I, I pay her a tremendous tribute for that, because there's no more important uh, skill, certainly for a scientist, but really for almost any profession, than to be able to express yourself uh, clearly and succinctly. Uh, and I think she really taught me that. But I did have the last laugh on, on Mrs. Gordon. I'll never forget it. Uh, so at the end of the school year, uh, she actually did the following, I think, ridiculous thing. She went around the class the day before we were to take the AP exam and predicted and wrote on the board what she thought each of us would get. I don't know if you know anything about that scoring system, but five is the highest grade you can get, then four and three and two. And depending on what score you got when you went to college the next year, you might either, if you get a top grade, you might get not just placed out of that course, but you might actually get credit for it. If you got a four, you know, somewhere, if three, you know, less, and if you got below a three, it was like you didn't take the course. So for many in the class, 
she she predicted a five, uh, and some a four, and for me she predicted a three and one other kid. And then she said she would write the scores on the board, you know, in a few weeks when they came in. P.S. I got a five, and I still remember looking at her when she wrote that up there, and I could see she was not happy about it. Oh, I'm sure she was happy, but she was she didn't like the idea that she'd been that off the mark. Uh, anyway, that was Mrs. Gordon. <laughs> She was not there when, uh, when I came back to Bronx Science, although interestingly, my 10th grade math teacher was. Now, in her 80s, uh, she doesn't teach anymore, but she had heard I was coming back. She keeps up with things, and uh, she actually was there, and she's amazing. I mean, uh, at first, I didn't remember her because it turned out, she told me, she had been, uh, it was her first year of teaching. So she was like probably 23, 24, and now she's like 85, uh, so there wasn't much resemblance. I was a chemistry major uh, at Columbia College, but I had no interest in doing research. I just, since I was pre-med, and I loved science, loved science, always did, biology, chemistry, all of it, uh, but I, I didn't want to do research. Uh, I went off to medical school at Columbia, and uh, we had several opportunities to do research in medical school. Uh, I passed them all up. I always did clinical electives. I never did a research elective because I had no interest in doing research, and I couldn't wait to get to the clinical stuff. So then I did two years of residency at Columbia after I graduated. So that br brings us to 1968. The Vietnam War is raging. Uh, there's a doctor draft. There's a general draft, which is on a lottery basis. But there's also a doctor draft, which means everybody goes in for two years. So you got two years of training, internship and one year of residency, and then you went in. And it was a very unpopular war. Uh, many of us did not want to go to Vietnam to serve. There were very few ways around it. One way is if you could win a commission in the United States Public Health Service, you could get assigned to something like the CDC uh, in Atlanta, or the NIH, or one or two other installations, and do research for two years. And so I was able, because of, I was at the top of my class, I was able to get the, that commission and go to the NIH. And there I started doing research uh, with no success whatsoever. So for the first 18 months of my two-year assignment there, uh, nothing I touched worked. Uh, I hated it. Uh, could not have been more miserable. My father died during that time, uh, which was a further blow. Uh, but I had never failed at anything. Uh, I'd always been top of my class. Things tend to come easily for me. And now this didn't work at all. So the only thing that was clear to me is I would not be a scientist, which was no great loss because I had never aspired to be one anyway. So I made arrangements to continue my clinical training uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is one of the Harvard-affiliated hospitals at the end of the two years. But during the last six months, things started to work, and I got my first taste of what it feels like you know, to make some scientific discoveries and write a paper and you know, get the attention that was involved in that, and it was fun. But it was time to go off to my residency. Uh, and then I had what was one of the defining uh, experiences of my career, which was, interestingly, sort of a an anti-experience, and that was the experience over the first, next six months of doing full-time clinical work again, which I enjoyed, but doing no research. And I really missed it. That was the key. The clinical work was intensive, uh, acute medicine. I was a senior resident in medicine. Uh, I spent about half the time as the senior resident in the emergency room. And an emergency room of a big city hospital like the Mass General is a wild place. Uh, and it's all comers, medicine, surgery, whatever's coming through the door, you're responsible for triaging it uh, or taking care of it yourself. And it's 12 hours on, 12 hours off, and after seven cycles of that, one 24 period off, 24 hours. And it was really intense. And, you know, I loved clinical medicine. I was good at it. Uh, I enjoyed it. But, boy, did I miss the lab. Uh, and it wasn't so much doing the experiments with my own hands that I missed. It was the idea of having data, having something to really chew on and analyze. This was just boom, 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 almost like on a battlefield. Uh, and I really missed the research. And so ironically, the entire second six months 
of the residency year uh, was elective. And you had to do clinical work, I mean, because you were paid with hospital dollars. And so in contravention of the rules, I actually went into somebody's laboratory. So the irony there was all through medical school, I turned down uh, research electives. And now in a situation where I couldn't legally do them, I did it anyway. Uh, I really had to get back to the laboratory. And that's really when my research career, to me, sort of really began to take shape. Although I was at that point by no means committed to a research career at all. In fact, when I, several years later, when I took up my first, and as it turns out, only faculty position at Duke in 1973, I would say at the beginning, I was probably spending about 50% of my time doing clinical work, doctoring, and 50% of the time setting up a laboratory. But that changed quickly over the next few years. That's easy, my trainees. Uh, in my field, uh, receptor biology, the field is dominated by people that I trained. Kobilk is one example. I would say I have, for years, in all due immodesty, I led the field. I've passed that mantle to Kobilka. Uh, he has the newest technologies and this and that. But he's just the limit case. There are dozens and dozens of people who trained with me if you go to any meeting on receptor biology and you look at the program, I don't know, 30, 40 percent of all the speakers will have either trained with me or trained with people who trained with me. They're in the lineage. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I'm most proud of. That would be the most proud. Second most proud, well, you know, we really changed the whole, we created a field and that field has changed drug development and led to dozens of drugs which really impact people's lives. I really should think about that more. I don't. Uh, yeah. I mean, drug development uh, was so cumbersome because you, you, the only way to have any sense of what a, a drug candidate might do would be to inject it into a living animal and make all kinds of detailed physiological recordings. Now, because we can isolate the receptors and work with them either in isolation or in cells, I mean, you can screen thousands, hundreds of thousands of compounds very quickly with these methods that we developed over the years. Now, did I develop the methods so that drugs could be developed like this? No. I just wanted to know what the receptors were. And to do that, I had to develop these technologies, which is a, a very interesting thing about basic research versus what's called translational research. I mean, the impetus to my research in the first instance was never to cure a specific disease, to change the way drugs were developed, any of it. I just wanted to know about these receptors. I mean, do they really exist? If so, what are they like? I mean, just curiosity about a specific problem. But if you choose a problem well, and you're lucky, uh, then, you know, Sometimes it can have big implications.